All right, um, so today we're gonna talk about container security, so what network administrators should know about going into production, things to think about. Um, so how many people here are playing with containers or using containers, I guess hands up? Okay, and out of curiosity, so who, who's focused on Docker specifically? Like maybe Docker or Docker Swarm, that ecosystem? Okay, kind of a lot. And then how about uh, Kubernetes? Just a few, okay, yeah, and that, what about Mesosphere, anybody out there? Yeah, okay, just a few as well. Okay, cool, just just wanted to, how, how about OpenStack in general? Is anybody, is anybody using OpenStack? Okay, cool, just a few as well. All right, so just wanted to level set so I know what, what people are interested in. Um, and how, how about network administrators? Are there any network or infrastructure people? Okay, so we mostly DevOps, so developers, yes? or DevOps specifically, pretty much, okay, okay. Um, so my background personally, I, I'm a systems engineer at Mirokura, we're a network virtualization um, company focused on that. Uh, our product is actually, was initially started six years ago, a um, company called Mirokura, um, fo mostly focused on the engineering of this product called Mironet, and then we went open source in, in 2014. Um, but my background personally is, I come from a hardware networking background, so I was focused initially more on service provider products, sort of layer one, layer two. I like to joke for networking people that I've kind of moved up in the, the networking layers, like started off on DSL products, layer one, two, uh, went over to MPLS, technologies for carrier, um, and then data center and, and campus. So I've been more focused on networking. I like to think about security too, now moving up in the stack, the, the networking stack. Um, so, you know, given this is DevOps and, and now I'm at more of a, uh, an open source and eco, uh, that sort of ecosystem company, um, I think two of the, two of the main things, the challenges are, you know, open source is really powerful, uh, but there's a lot of things that Kevin just talked about, the integrating with this whole host of tooling and integration and, and the way technology advances, but th th that's part of the awesome thing about open source is all these awesome technologies come out of it. Uh, the other, the other main thing is how do you drive adoption? Um, just with new technologies, people are weary. There's obstacles to overcome, and then of course, how do you move into production specifically? Um, so all these things need to be sort of thought about. So today, more I'm going to talk about if my slides want to advance um, containers, and then of course, you know what's come out of containers because th they're not that new of a concept anymore. It's a lot of people are there's a lot of buzz about it, and that continued buzz still exists, but um, they've actually been around for a while. Also, you know, the movement to container orchestration, how to manage multiple containers, how to deploy applications and develop for them. Um, but as we'll see, even with other technologies, like, like OpenStack, as an example, uh, networking is always seems to be an afterthought. And, and this ends up being a hurdle, actually, when going to production, because there's these security implications, or how do you scale an application? Um, a lot of these things, you know, network can you know, make or break uh, moving into production. So why containers? Um, yeah, as those of you who are playing around with it already, um, and know, you know it's a lightweight way to deploy, and it, it's a more efficient way to, to build an app, smaller bits and bytes, you don't have to, less, less overhead than a virtual machine, because you're not repeating the, the complete operating system for every single container. And what that means in infrastructure is you get a lot more increased density on a physical host. So that, that has implications on the network, of course, too. Um, but as developers, it's empowering to, to be able to do something in a portable manner, like a container image on your desktop, and then you know, go to staging and, and, and beyond after that. Um, so of course, not being new, LXC has been around for a while, um, leveraging things for security like um, you know, SE Linux, C groups, uh, kernel namespaces. Um, the focus was previously more on systems containers. Um, and of course, things changed. Uh, so LXC version 1.0 was only, in the end, it was only released two years ago, right? So, uh, but that, that brought about more security with unprivileged containers. Um, and then the ecosystem initially was uh, probably not as hot as it is now. But why is it hot now? Docker. Docker, you know, everybody knows. Docker's the, the way that developers got their hands on containers in an, easy, um, in an easy fashion right on their desktop. So it enabled a lot of development right on their desktop, 
an easy container imaging format. Um, security, you know, was more done through Linux bridge and IP tables. You know, some where I come from, we kind of cringe at IP tables, so uh, makes people feel uncomfortable and doesn't scale well. Uh, but the ecosystem has totally grown around this. So container orchestration um, technologies, like we were just talking about, Kubernetes and Mesosphere. Um, companies like CoreOS, um, who have you know, t propelled these um, technologies as well, and advanced it even beyond Docker using other container formats. Um, so, of course, all these container orchestration engines came along, and that's what helps really deploy um, applications on a wider scale. Um, so things that they can take into account are how clustering, clustering containers, um, and therefore defining services, perhaps having load balancer or service replication um, to enable having that app always up. But, you know, that's the dream, right? So that's where we all want to be. The expectation is, you know, chase that dream. Um, but the reality is when it's time to go to production, probably someone like your network security person or admin is going to contain you. <laughs> so multiple ways that would be done, right? So, um, you know, uh, kernel namespaces, um, SE Linux, just that, and that could affect the way the app is actually deployed. Um, so, you know, it might totally hit a hurdle in the app or, um, you know, you don't want to leave this, these things open to vulnerabilities. So what's the problem then? What's, why are containers insecure? Uh, they weren't designed to be, you know, fully isolated the way VMs are. Um, not everything in Linux is namespaced and therefore, you know, there's some shared um, processes and there's some shared um, components on a physical host. And what that means is you, you can't assume that the container next to you on the same physical host is totally isolated and can't reach you. Um, but what, is, what does that do to the network as well? So even coming off a physical host, you have to think about those type of things. Um, so yeah, the, the container orchestration engine helped the, helped the clustering and the deployment of multiple apps, but what about the networking? And as I mentioned, even uh, you know, previous uh, technologies that were adopted widely on the open source world, like OpenStack, sort of left networking to the very end. Um, you know, everybody's excited about the technology and deploying and having new tooling, um, and the networking is more like the, the plumbing, the, the boring afterthought. Um, so we're sort of seeing similar patterns here with how to address networking with container orchestration engines. Um, that we saw in these other technologies. So the framework is sort of being redefined. We feel like we're reinventing the wheel. Open source communities, the part of the beauty is bringing a lot of collaborators together from various organizations. Um, but the problem is you're going through that, that battle again, and in the end, there's, a, there's only a set defined uh, type of way to define networking too. So it just depends on the abstraction level, um, what kind of battles. So even in this world, um, what m networking model does one choose? Because you know, Docker is, leans towards this container networking model, which we'll talk about th those definitions, uh, whereas Kubernetes and Mesosphere are leaning towards this container networking interface model, and they both approach networking a little, little differently. Um, so, don't know why it's always last, but maybe it's just not, not, the, not the hot technology stuff, I guess. Um, so who's going to care? Well, your network, your network administrators and your security team are definitely going to care. You can't just leave everything wide open. You know, some of these projects, um, you know, started by Google, uh, like uh, you know, the, the 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 roots of Kubernetes. You know, everything was internal and open, so they, they didn't really care. But as soon as you start deploying these in public spaces, you're going to start caring about well, which part of your apps are talking to each other. So that's why you should care too. Um, so containers, as I mentioned, you know, you're increasing the, the density on a physical host, and therefore in your infrastructure, you're just going to get all way more endpoints uh, in your network and infrastructure. So uh, that means more complexity. And this is sort of trying to depict the microservices type approach to deploying applications, which of course you know has benefits from many levels, right? The best of read type engineering for the, the specific uh, microservices that are deployed, uh, which means you know, better and easier development for, for developers, um, easier to manage in terms of um, operations, like in terms of isolating t parts of those microservices and how they operate together. Um, and also from a business standpoint, 
um, being more efficient in your operations. But in the end, in the network, this gets much, very, very complex. So, and even just managing all these points, um, you know, talking about operations, a, a lot of people like to blame the networking people. You know, why does it take so long for me to get a VLAN uh, configured on my router or switch? I need a subnet now. I want to. I want to deploy quickly, or I want to test something really quickly. Why does it take me so long to get networking? So what's important is we bring these networking aspects into the agility of these uh, more dynamic, um, more dynamic tooling. Uh, but it gets it gets more complex when you have to think consider security um, and as well as scale. So this little guy, you'll see him again. He's our courier man. Um, so in legacy infrastructure, you typically have you know all your your servers you know connected with leaf leaf switches going up to spine type core, and then usually your firewalls are more at your core. So this is considered more. Perimeter, perimeter security type approach. Um, that's more of a legacy type approach. And that was fine uh, like back when we had more north-south type traffic flows. So more bare metal type workloads. Um, so things were coming in and out of the data center. Um, so you could just handle that. But that, that of course, um, poses a problem if you have an attack on the inside. All you have to do is cross that one barrier and then you know, you're, you're ex your rest of your network's exposed. Um, so, with virtualization, there tend to be a lot more um, east-west traffic bound flows. So, how to manage that? Well, you know, one approach was using these virtual network functions, and that means just like using firewalls, and these could be virtual appliances, and then they're in the data path of these virtual machines. And so, how do you manage that? Where do you put them? Uh, so, there's a lot to think about there. So, more doesn't necessarily equal better. Like, it's managing more pinch points. Um, and you're still kind of, it's sort of still guesswork on where to place those, um, depending on how, how your east-west traffic flows are. So I thought, you know, it's Thursday, right? <laughs> I don't know, it's been a long week already. Um, so throwback Thursday, gonna throw back to OpenStack as a reminder. Like, what were the challenges there on the networking side? And it, it's, it sort of feels like it's being repeated on the container side. So for those who aren't familiar, Open, OpenStack is a, an open source, um, a large open source community that uh, develops com compute, basically. Um, and so many projects have come and spun out of that. But the core was storage and compute. And this was started, yeah, six years ago, I guess, 2010. Um, it's gained a lot of traction. Uh, you know, these OpenStack summits are every six months, and they're in the order of like seven to 9,000 people now, it seems. Uh, but it's enabled you know, a lot of engineers from different um, areas to, and di different expertise to come together. And again, in the, in the beginning it was rough. It was rough going into production with this. Um, so people didn't trust it, but it, it's definitely come a long way since six years ago uh, where people have been running in production for many years now. But as I mentioned, so Neutron is the, the networking project within OpenStack. And it was late to the game. So networking initially, originally was under the compute project. So that means it, it, wasn't really, it didn't really have that much attention. Nobody really thought about it. Um, the, it was more cool to you know, get your virtualization going on your servers. And no one was scaling yet because it wasn't production anyway. Uh, but as soon as start, people started going to production, they realized, OK, there are some inherent problems with the way we're doing networking. We need to focus on it. We need to define it as a framework. Um, so in the end, Neutron is this project, and it's a networking framework. Um, so there's a reference architecture, um, but also the things that came out of being an individual project was that there was a push to have it have a pluggable nature, which means there could be multiple solutions inserted to provide the, those, those set defined of networking APIs. Um, so this, is, this uh, formed an advanced networking framework. You can have really interesting architectures, uh, tiered architectures, um, layer two, three, four networking services. Um, well, that's what I wanted to get to actually. So part of the beauty was, you know, multi-tenancy was a really important aspect of OpenStack, having isolated workloads, um, and a whole host of these, these network functions from switching, routing, um, and people have various ways of implementing these things, but these are things that are important, and they apply also to containers, as we'll see. Um, these are just, uh, so virtual machines are, could be just considered endpoints, uh, and all this type of functionality can be provided to whatever that workload is in the end. 
And it could be, and it's, in the end, it's just mimicking what we know from, from hardware networking, you know, like ACLs, uh, stateful firewalls, NATing, um, you know, the way that we are, we're moving forward to deploy um, applications. And there's several different vendors and projects. Some of them are proprietary, some of them are open source projects. Um, so Metonet is a completely open source project. Um, OVS is the, the original reference architecture with OpenStack. And these are all hardened uh, Neutron plugins that people are using in production today. So I'm gonna throw, as I mentioned, throwing a bunch of open, open source projects names out there. Has anyone heard of Courier? No? All right. Eh? Yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> Good job. Uh, so Courier actually, so it's Czech for Courier, so like a trans, <laughs> uh, a carrier of, of uh, network packets, I guess you could say. Um, and actually it was started by originally a, a former Mito Kura um, developer. And uh, so he likes check things, that's how he came up with his name. Um, and what it entails is it's an open stack, it's a project basically under the OpenStack umbrella, um, but it can be used outside of OpenStack, um, as we'll see. And it basically leverages this framework that was already predefined by this wider community um, for this networking framework with advanced networking functionality and applying it to containers. Um, so, you know, not having to reinvent the wheel, but just leverage uh, the already existing network framework that exists from Neutron. Especially since um, the, so the container networking model and the container networking interface are really not that mature and it's going through the same battles, even, even the identical, um, identical processes like IP tables which is known to not scale well and these are like the things that were tripped on in OpenStack um, and recovered from and those were kind of being repeated in the container world. So the mission is to, to bridge container networking uh, to the, these OpenStack network abstractions. Um, so what is Courier, as I mentioned? It's, it's bridging those, these container networking to these OpenStack Neutron networking abstractions. Um, but what it literally is, is these group of projects, uh, they're all um, up on GitHub. So Courier lib is the, the common libraries between all of these uh, container orchestration engines. So what's important is what you, from what's leveraged from OpenStack is the, the Neutron client, so the definition of the framework. Uh, the Keystone client, which is used for authentication, uh, and then in turn some of the vendor bindings that, that, that happen at the physical host. Um, Courier Lib Network is focused on the Docker networking plugin, uh, Courier uh, Kubernetes, and this is just where it stands today. It's obviously an evolving project and continues to be worked on. Um, Courier Kubernetes is the, the Kubernetes API watcher and CNI driver, which we'll go over also. And then there's also um, this other project that is focusing on the, the storage aspects, um, that how that could be leveraged um, from OpenStack as well. So it's, this is like a growing project. Um, it's already got wide adoption across uh, multiple contributors and vendors. Um, so that it's uh, been widely received and welcomed um, for enabling Neutron in the container world. Um, so I'll talk first a little bit about Docker since these are the more mature um, projects from Courier. Um, so Lib Network is the, the project within, um, within Docker that focuses on um, the networking, obviously. So there are various types. These are the, I, I put an asterisk for former because things sort of changed with Docker 1.12. Um, but for backwards compatibility, you know, they kept the three main ones, the null, uh, bridge, and overlay. So, and then the remote driver, which is where the Courier fits in. But how do these uh, play out with, with security? Well, no, obviously not really anything. So you're relying on the, your perimeter firewall or your physical box upstream. Uh, the bridge, IP tables, overlay IP tables, you know, these are things that you know, have been known to have issues um, and don't scale well. Uh, and then there's the remote driver, which allows for you know, some external third party um, organization to come in and leverage, and that's where Courier leverages uh, Neutron. And so, so this has been working, uh, Courier's been working with Docker Lib Network since 1.9. Um, so it's, as I mentioned, it's the remote driver, but Courier actually handles two things, the, the IPAM, so passing the IP addressing to 
the containers, and then also the binding that happens on the physical host. So from a networking perspective, you know, these, these from our, well, I'll speak specifically from MetoNet perspective, um, container can just be like an endpoint at the end of a virtual topology. Uh, so the way we handle it is you can build whatever virtual topology you want with whatever functionality, and to us, it just looks like a port. It's a virtual port, just like the way we treated virtual machines. Um, so there's not a lot of things that have to happen or change on the back end. We can leverage a production grade networking solution and apply that to containers. But so Docker, oh, so I did mention, yeah, Docker 112. So Docker 112 was announced at DockerCon, um, I guess back in June. Uh, what they did was uh, they talked more about their, their clustering with Docker Swarm. And uh, unfortunately, the only supported networking they had was the, the overlay solution there. Um, so the Courier project is hoping for Docker 113 that you know, they'll have time to work with Docker and, and insert again as the remote driver. Um, so I think, I think Docker 112 was just released quickly and um, you know, didn't have time for the third party vendors to insert. But the way the abstraction looks is um, the, the important definitions are the sandbox, the endpoint, and, and the backend network. And this is different from how Kubernetes um, um, defines networking in the fact that it doesn't define networking. Docker explicitly defines um, networks and um, subnets. So Courier, what it does is it leverages Docker's push model for the architecture, and when those calls are made to lib network, Courier does a translation to Neutron networking. So this allows any Neutron solution to be leveraged within a Docker container environment. Um, so it just does a translation, it makes the call according to what Neutron is, Neutron has its solution and that solution goes and implements the way it always did before. Uh, and so that means you can apply a host of functionality to containers without having to wait for a particular um, definition, these things have already been well defined and proven with more solid production grade networking. So a whole host of functionality that can be applied to Docker. So just one example, you know, courier, so Courier with MetoNet, MetoNet is specifically a, a Neutron plugin, so that could, that's one option that I mentioned that could be used with Courier. Um, so the, basically when the Docker API calls are being made, Courier is doing that translation to the Neutron, um, and then, so for example, it's providing the IP, and then what ends up happening at the back end is each vendor or solution has a, a binding script, so that's what's happening locally on the, the physical host where the container might live. Um, and uh, so these calls are being made and the binding is created, and that way the networking solution knows which exact phys physical host the container resides on. And then after that, you have the freedom to apply all these networking um, definitions that were from Neutron um, and have a production grade networking solution. So that's career for CNM, but now what's developed, what we've seen is there actually has been, we've seen um, uh, from you know, the sample of set that we've spoken with, uh, people have this adoption of Kubernetes. And Kubernetes doesn't have the exact same framework for networking as Docker. And so there's this other standard called CNI. Um, but so why is Kubernetes important? Uh, well, it's already a proven solution within Google, uh, so Google happened to open source it. Um, of course, you know there were some some it was different different it was implemented differently at Google, uh, but now that it's open source, it's driven it's gotten tons of adoption in the last 12 months. We've seen like huge growth, and even in the ecosystem, um, several vendors have supported this because of the interest. So I'll just go over a little bit of the Kubernetes architecture and then how it fits in um, on the networking side with Courier. Um, so what's challenging with Kubernetes is it has more of a pull model. So that means, so any kind of so Courier, in the end the implementation has to watch for the events that happen in order to uh, make any kind of configuration changes. Um, I, I'll probably speak really briefly that you know, it almost sort of looks like OpenStack in the sense that you know, it has this master node, kind of like the OpenStack controller. So this is taking care of um, the state storage, uh, the API servers, and things like that. And then um, you know, where the work happens is actually on the worker nodes. 
Um, and that's you know, what you consider compute nodes where the containers and pods are actually living. So in, in the Kubernetes world, the, the definition is more of a pod with that's supported by containers. Um, and in terms of networking, you would look at it as an IP per pod. So these are more of like the compute, um, the compute nodes from the OpenStack world or where the work's happening with the containers and pods. So etcd is where, you know, the persistent state storage, um, taking care of that. These things are happening all on the control plane through the master node. Uh, the Kubernetes API server is running there. Scheduler, uh, the controller, man controller manager server. And Kubernetes is built in a way that all these things are supposed to be interchangeable um, and pluggable, actually. That's probably a better word. Um, so what Courier has done, um, and on the worker node, there's these kubelets that are managing uh, the specific containers on the, the worker nodes, and then kube proxy, which is kind of what you'll see with Courier, the way it was um, developed. It's basically providing a load balancing type functionality and implementing it through IP tables on the physical host. Um, so keeping that in mind, uh, the, con the Kubernetes networking model strives to um, define itself with network policy, actually, which is you know, a series of labels applied to a service, and that sort of therefore defines what's allowed and not allowed to talk. Uh, so more of a whitelist approach. Um, but there's the distinct problems that they, they recognize are container to container communications, uh, pod to pod communications, pod to service communications, and external to internal communications. Um, so one of the, the main uh, default solutions for Kubernetes is Flannel. It provides, uh, so originally, even in the early days, just like Docker, um, things were open and uh, you know, weren't necessarily doing NATing, but you'd, you, could have, you couldn't have basically um, cross-host communication. So that, in turn, enabled or called for an overlay to enable cross-host communication. Um, so an overlay just puts a tag in front of the packet. So one example would be like VXLAN header uh, to define the service and uh, enable cross-host communication. Uh, so th some of the problems with that, well, as I mentioned, so IP tables for NATing and maybe security, depending on you know how good you are with working with IP tables, because the definitions are not really there yet with the framework. Um, and then multi-tenancy. Um, if you're doing like a host per tenant, what happens to if your physical host goes down? You know, how happy is your tenant then? Um, other things to consider is, you know, even with the movement towards containerization, um, people are still working with a lot of virtual machines, so not everything is immediately containerizable. Um, so how do you share uh, containers and um, VMs on the same network or the same solution? You know, how do you do these kind of things? And then there's still a security risk um, where Flannel is using the, the Docker bridge and they're still sharing the networking stack with everything on the same physical host. So I'll talk about some MetoNet integration with Kubernetes specifically, but any, any and Courier, but any Neutron networking solution could be used with Courier. Um, as I mentioned, this um, MetoNet came out of the company MetoCura, which was started six years ago. Um, our founders and our CTO, they, they have more of a distributed systems background. Um, so they worked at Amazon previously, um, and that was their specialty and expertise. Um, so when they built the architecture of MetoNet, it was specifically so that it was a solution that scaled um, without any bottlenecks or, or pinch points. Um, so it's, it's more of a distributed systems type architecture. Um, and then of course, another highlight is in, in 2014, uh, we went open source. So every, everything's available um, on GitHub. It's completely open. Um, so what that meant is some of the, the way that the, the networking solution was achieved was actually at the edge of the network. Um, so all the intelligence is at the edge. The edge only needs the information for the things like leaving the box. Um, but that in turn also means the security. So if, you're, if you have a policy um, or a secure um, firewall rule, for example, um, the MetoNet is simulating it at the edge, um, pretending the packet goes through whatever logical topology was built. And if there's a rule anywhere that says drop it, it's not even gonna leave the physical host. So it's eliminating these hairpins and, and um, bottlenecks to virtual network functions or even, you know, your, your perimeter um, firewalling, for example. And that's what gives it the ability to scale. Um, so with, with Kubernetes, the, today, so this is Docker, libnetwork, 
work that was done with Career um, is a little more advanced. Uh, that's upstream now um, and released to work with Docker standalone and the old Docker Swarm before 1.12 um, and then expected to be with 1.13 onwards. Um, with Kubernetes integration with Career, it's a little more new. Um, even with, uh, with Metonet, it's still in tech preview stages. Um, but it works starting with uh, Kubernetes 1.2, which is what was officially tested. Um, and then the two integration points are uh, the CNI driver that sits at every worker node, and that's what's doing the binding. So that's how the solution knows this container is on this worker node, and it's tied to this logical network. Uh, and then Raven, and that's the name of the, the process that's at the master node and is doing the listening for all the events. So any, any of the Kubernetes API calls that are made, um, Raven is doing the listening for that. Um, so looking at default versus how it's enhanced by Courier to get these at more advanced networking functions. Um, so I mentioned QProxy resides at the, at the worker node at the edge server, um, and then Flannel is one example of an overlay solution at the edge um, with a pretty simple, um, more primitive overlay. Um, and that's enhanced by using the CNI driver that's residing at, um, at the worker nodes, uh, Raven at the master node, uh, and then in this case, MetoNet agent or whatever networking solution likely um, implementing at, at the worker node. And as you can see, the definitions are a little different than we saw with the, the container networking model. Um, so it's uh, a little more, uh, there's a, a few more definitions here. Um, some of the isolation being achieved with namespaces. Um, so a namespace would match would map to uh, the Neutron API network. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, a pod would represent like a port or something that might ask for an IP. Um, and then in the end, when you're defining a service, what makes Kubernetes powerful is you have these options to define a service, a replication factor, and then the load balancing that's checked on it. So, you know, health checks that are done. If, if one pod's going down, Kubernetes is gonna bring another one up. Um, but in turn, what from, a networking perspective, that is just load balancing. So the, the service uh, equates to the load balancing VIP and then these endpoints um, on the back end would just be these, these load balancer pool members. Um, I will take a closer look at the worker node, as I mentioned. Um, so Kubelet, the Kubelet still remains on the worker node um, we replace QProxy, which was doing, figuring out the load balancing and endpoints, um, and that meant, you know, per host. Uh, whereas now, MetoNet Agent, which has um, a cloud-wide awareness, um, resides there and programs the, the kernel uh, data path. Um, so today, today, where are we, like Courier and MetoNet specifically? As I mentioned, it's in tech preview. Um, these functions were done, the CNI driver, Raven the, as the watcher, uh, the namespace implementation, uh, specifically done on CoreOS. So yeah, as I mentioned earlier, CoreOS has you know, made great strides to um, be the supporting operating system for these container orchestration um, tools. Um, and that, what was interesting for MetoNet was you know, we had one process that was running in user space, programming the kernel. Um, now all of our processes are actually containerized, so that's kind of cool. So I think that has more benefits even beyond just working with container orchestration engines. Um, but specifically, uh, or more broadly speaking, Courier, uh, the bigger project, um, Courier, where will it go next? It will go and define more of uh, bridging containers and virtual machines. Um, so you can already um, attach containers to existing Neutron networks, um, but more you know, testing and consistency there. Uh, the multi-tenancy aspect, obviously, so that isolation across worker nodes um, and taking those aspects of isolation as well, allowing you know tenants to define their own security policies or administrators on top of that. Um, then, of course, the more advanced networking services that come with Neutron, especially as these um, the container networking model and container networking interface get uh, better defined, they can map to already existing Neutron components. Um, QoS, of course, too, you, you know, taking care of bandwidth from a networking perspective, traffic, traffic shaping, making sure things aren't being hogged, and prioritizing maybe certain applications. Um, and then, of course, things of interest are working with other container orchestration engines. So 
adapting to whatever their API framework might be. So, you know, definitely I think probably at the top of the list is working with Mesosphere. There's a lot of popularity there. Um, and, and Cloud Foundry and OpenShift. Um, and then Magnum support as well, making sure that works. So Magnum in OpenStack is putting containers in VMs for isolation um, and defining bays and leveraging these, these orchestration engines. So Courier will work with that project as well. So I think I sort of tried to whip through it because I, I know you guys are probably getting hungry, but I wanted to make sure you guys got a little bit more education on these open source projects focused on security for containers. Um, and as I mentioned, both of these projects are um, open source as well as, of course, OpenStack and Kubernetes uh, and Mesos. So, but I thought I would uh, just share some of the, the information so these kind of th these kind of things interest you or you know people who are interested in learning more about it and joining. We always welcome more community members. So, so thanks for your time. Hopefully, uh, you know we can all take a deep breath now because I probably talked your ear off. But thanks for your attention. <laughs>